Hi everybody, I'm Z Garcia, and today I'll be taking a look at the latest game in the Pandemic franchise, Pandemic Rising Tide. Much like Pandemic Iberia before it and Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu, Pandemic Rising Tide here takes the original Pandemic formula and, and twists it up, adds a new theme to it and a few new mechanisms while retaining the feel for the most part of the original game and the basic turn structure, what you are attempting to do. The game is a cooperative game, but in this case, you are in a different setting. You are in the Netherlands, and you are trying to keep the ocean from rising too much and claiming the land. And so you'll be working towards setting some hydraulic pumps in place, keeping your dice well maintained, and keeping that ocean water out. While again, cooperating with everyone else in order to accomplish that. Let me give you a look at how the game operates. We'll come on back after that. I'll give you some final thoughts. Here's what the game looks like, set up and ready to begin. I've placed all of the dice in the designated spots on the board, put out some water cubes, and then degraded some of the different locations by flipping over nine cards from the deck, just as you would in regular Pandemic. And when a region degrades, we are removing some of those dice that we placed in setup, possibly also adding some water. We'll come back to how that works in one second. Each player is going to have a character, as you can see here, I might give you a glimpse at those a little later, and then we start in that spot there. The objective of the game is to build these four hydraulic structures here. Once you've placed all four of these in the spots where they are going to be built on the board, then you win the whole thing. And on your turn, uh, very much like in Pandemic, you are going to, first of all, take four actions. I'll talk about what the actions are. After that, you operate the pumps, assuming you've built any on the board. After that, we draw two player cards and we resolve any storms, the storms in this case being the equivalent of an epidemic card. And then the dikes are going to fail by flipping over the bad cards. And then the water will reflow if it needs to do so, all right? So actions, what are the actions that the players can take? Everyone is going to have one of these cards. I'll show you what this looks like up close. But basically the different things you can do are as follows. You can drive or ferry, which simply means move across the lines on the board to a different region. You can sail, which is discard a card from your hand to go directly to that spot. You can take a charter boat, which is discard the card of the region you're in to go anywhere you want. Return to a port, which lets you, uh, once you've built some of these ports on the board, go directly to a port from anywhere you are. You don't have to leave from a port, you just have to go to one. You can pump water, which means if you're somewhere with water, you can pump one cube of that water out. You can also build more dikes anywhere you want to as long as the region you are in does not have any water. And you can build even more than one of these per location that can have them. So you can stock up if you'd like, you can do that. Uh, you can build pumping stations and build ports. That requires you to discard the card of the place where you are. If you put out a pumping station, it will pump water out during the uh, pumps operate step. And then the ports, as I already told you, you can uh, move around more easily with them. You can share resources, which again, just like in regular pandemic, if you're in the same place, you can give or take a card that matches where you are. And then lastly, and the way you win, you can discard five cards of the appropriate color add one of the structure locations and build that hydraulic structure, which also, when it comes into play, gives you some kind of instant bonus. Put out uh, uh, several more dikes, perhaps uh, remove water immediately, things like that. So that's the general flow of the game, and the players are going to be playing cards, taking their actions in order to move around and do different um, activities to contain the water flowing in and get those structures built. The way you lose is if the deck runs out of cards and you need to draw some more, then you've run out of time. If you need more water cubes than the ones provided, 
then uh, the water has simply flown in too much and you were unable to stop it. And then also there, there uh, may be uh, some uh, different alternatives to losing in a variant that I'll be showing you later on. This is the base game, okay? So that's how that works. So for example, let's say it's my turn here with the sanitation engineer. The sanitation engineer, as an action, can take a region card matching their current region from the discard pile. And so uh, there's nothing in there now, obviously, but so let's say I move in here for one action, I'm gonna pump water out for my second action, and now for my third and fourth actions, I'm gonna build up two new dikes because there's no water in there now. So I'll place one here, and I'll place one here to prevent more water flow. That's my four actions. After that, we operate the pumps, but there are no pumps, okay? If there were some pumps, let's say there is a pump here, one of the players built earlier, then that allows you to pump water out of, out of the uh, locations that are connected to it. As long as there is water where the pump is, you can pump out one cube of water from somewhere connected directly to it. You cannot cross dikes by doing this. So for example, from uh, this pump, I could remove a cube from here, or I could remove one from the location it's in itself, obviously, or even from here. This here represents the ocean, so obviously I cannot pump water out of that. Uh, so let's say, just for the sake of our example, that we're going to pump water out of there. After that step comes the draw two player cards step, in which we draw two player cards. You always have a hand of seven, that's a, your hand limit. And then after that, we are going to do the dikes fail step. This over here tells us the level of the ocean, how many of these we have to flip. So we flip over one and you look for that location on the map, and then the dikes in there are going to degrade. If there are any, you remove one of them from uh, that spot. If there are none, you add a water cube instead. All right, so that's the first card. My second card is this one, and I am going to remove that one there. And then after that, the water flows. So we check any locations that have three water cubes, and they flow into any location that doesn't have a dike uh, in the way up to two water cubes. And so, for example, uh, let's uh, mess with our board state here a little bit. Let's say there are three in this ocean, and the oceans do rise eventually when those storm cards come up. So let's say there are three in this ocean. Well, the water is going to flow from any place that has three cubes up to two. So in here there are already two, in here there are already two, but this location would rise to two and this location would rise to two. And now, any place that has twos, the water would flow into anything that is not being uh, stopped up to one cube. And so this location would get one cube from this one, it flows into here, and then these don't have an open spot to any place that doesn't already have one, yeah? If this already had one, it does not flow more water in there, it's already at one, okay? And that's the end of the step of the of the round. And the next player would go and take their actions. They have their four actions, pumps, all of that. Um, that's the general flow of the game. At some point, you are going to try to get these hydraulic structures built. Once you do, you're going to place them out on the board. And once you've placed all four, then you are going to win the whole game. Besides this, and by the way, be real, real careful of what I just did because you're going to have a nightmarish time remembering where these dikes came from. Don't bump the board in this game. Um, the storms, which I uh, gave you a quick glimpse of, work very much like an epidemic. You are first going to rise the level of the ocean. You are then going to draw one of the cards from the bottom of this deck and you are going to degrade that area three times. So in this case, it's this area here. We would do one, two, and then for the third, there are no dikes, so it gets a water cube instead, okay? And then the last step of a storm is we grab all these and we are going to shuffle them and they go back on top of the pile and we continue on to the um, dikes fail step and so on. Uh, other than that, you are going to have a few special cards that have been shuffled into the deck. The number of these depends on the number of players, and they give you some sort of special powers. Uh, like this one says, skip the dikes fail step on this turn. Uh, this one says, choose one region during the next water flows step. Don't add any water to that region. Uh, you have a few different ones. The current player may do three more actions this turn and so on and so on. There's quite a few of these, and you're only gonna use uh, a handful, again, depending on the number of players. 
that's the general idea. That that gives you uh, an overall uh, experience of the game. You can make the game more difficult, of course, by adding more storm cards to the game. Uh, but you can also play with the included variant in the game. And that variant goes like this. It's going to add, first of all, population cubes, which are these orange cubes and also this population track, which is a new way to lose the game. If you ever lose five population cubes, you've lost the whole thing. And then you would use these variant goals. Now, playing with this variant, it's possible that you will not have to build all four of these hydraulic structures to win the game, though you can still do that if you want to get the benefits that you receive from building them. But basically, per color, you are going to shuffle these up and take out a card, and that's gonna be what you're attempting to do. So four of these, one per color. One of the three in each color is what they call the basic objective, which is build that structure. So every color has the simply built the structure objective. But there are two other objectives per color. One is a population objective, which simply is going to say, you need to he have at least this much population in these regions in order to win. And then the last one is what they call a special objective, which is something different. In this case for green, for example, says have at least four ports in green regions. So I need to make sure that I build a bunch of these ports in green to achieve that uh, goal and attempt to win the game. That would do it, okay? So that's how each of the colors works. The population cubes, by the way, you would discard cards from your hand of the matching colors, one, two, or three, to add one, two, or three population cubes to where you are. So that's how you put population on the board. It's a brand new action you can take. However, when water is added to a place, if it ever would, uh, if you would ever have to add water and it would take the cubes up above three cubes, then you must lose population to readjust for that. And again, that population loss gets tracked on this card and you need to watch out for that. So that's the general idea. That's how you play. Hopefully that uh, gives you an understanding of the general, no pun intended, flow of the game. So let's go back up top and let me give you some final thoughts. Before I get going here with some discussion topics, I should mention that Pandemic, the original Pandemic, is my favorite game of all time, and I very much enjoy all of the uh, spin-offs that I've played so far. Uh, so this game does, in some ways, have mighty big shoes to fill, all right? Uh, but let's kick it off talking about, of course, thematic ties. And the theme in this game is great. I like the new setting, and I like that they took the original Pandemic formula here, and really repurposed it to the point that it's a bit of a stretch to call this pandemic except for as a, as a branding uh, opportunity because you are simply keeping water out. It's one color of cube, it's just water. You are not fighting diseases, you are not researching or curing anything. You are building structures and keeping the water out. So from a thematic point of view, the game feels like pandemic mechanically but thematically it's not really even remotely close but i do enjoy the new location and setting and i think they did a great job of adapting those mechanisms to this new concept so thematically i'm very pleased with this game the aesthetics which is quality of the components the look of everything is probably my biggest gripe in this game i think the board looks bland i think all the muted colors don't pop on the board. I think uh, it's very busy. I think having all of the, uh, the little dikes everywhere makes setup a bit of a pain, but also uh, you have to be uh, very careful that you don't drop anything near the board because you'll jostle everything around. And just from a visual clarity point of view, uh, it's it's rough. It's not it's not great. It's a big gripe I have, and I just I I'm I have not been enjoying the look of this game. I've been um, playing it uh, quite a bit, despite the way it looks. I don't think that this shape of uh, to represent the uh, different dikes in the game translates well to this topography and map that they went with. They uh, the map has rivers that uh, run across it, but they do not divide sections. You need to look for dashed lines that divide sections and so so it's going to take some time getting used to seeing a blue line cut a uh, region in half not meaning anything 
I wish that they would have abstracted the look of this game a little bit more and make it more playable while perhaps less true to the real location. I know they are celebrating history here and a real world place, but I would have put usability and legibility first myself. Um, so those are some big issues I have with the game. Replayability and scalability are both uh, great. I think the uh, the game tactically is very challenging, and it's gonna uh, for me it did. It's gonna take a while to come to terms with how to do well. The whole concept of pumping water out uh, and learning how to counteract it just basically flowing right back in again is gonna take some some time. Uh, this game was quite punishing for quite a few games for me until I sort of wrapped my head around what I should be doing instead of what I thought I should be doing. So replayability is certainly there. The game is very variable and it's, and it's quite different from uh, the original pandemic in many ways. Uh, you are going to have, for example, each of these locations on the board has two cards in the deck, not one. So you could get surprised that way by having a card come up more than once for a location before you expect it to. Um, and a few other things. That's that's one of those things, okay? So, that's good. Game length is solid. It is a little bit longer than, than uh, any of the other pandemics I can think of. It's um, longer than Basic Pandemic and Iberia and Reign of Cthulhu. Certainly longer than Reign of Cthulhu. That's the shortest one, I suppose. And partly that's because this deck of cards here is bigger. There are more, uh, there are more locations. So this is uh, approximately... Uh, 10 cards uh, larger, which is that many more turns, okay? So the game, if you if it comes to down to losing by running out of these cards, the game will be longer. A little bit, a little bit. And so, but it's not problematic. I'm not saying it outstays. It's welcome. I think the game length is fine, but be aware, uh, this is the pandemic you might want to check out if you're looking for a little more to chew on, all right? Ease of play. Which is fiddliness, uh, any weird design choices, things like that. I already talked about fiddliness. I I do think the game is fiddly. I, I think it's uh, unfortunately fiddly. Some of the regions are have hard to appreciate shapes, you know, long and skinny, and some sections are quite large. I, there's one, there's some regions which they call high elevation regions. There's one massive one near the bottom of the map that is actually connected to quite a few things and you can walk in there and it makes it tricky to to see that you can get from some regions that would appear to be quite far away from other regions just by hopping in there and then hopping back out on the other side um so again things like that i find to be a little tricky but mostly these the dikes and the muted color of everything and the squiggly lines that then get a straight wooden stick sitting on top of them. Uh, not not great. Not great. I'm not super happy with the uh, with the fiddliness. Is the game easy to learn and play? Yeah, it is. But it's uh, you're going to be fighting the look of the game and the fiddliness of the bits a little bit. Um, and then lastly, tactics and strategy and uh, luck. I think the game is is uh, highly tactical. It's it's a it's a crunchy game. It's uh, it's deep. It's interesting. It's engaging. It's going to make you, especially if you're a big fan of Pandemic, rethink a lot of things and tackle a lot of things you are perhaps used to tackling in new and interesting ways. Um, so that's interesting, you know, that, that's uh, clever. All right, so having said all of that, let me give you some just final thoughts here. And again, I will reinstate that I'm a huge Pandemic fan. Of all of these spin-off games, including Pandemic, okay, this is my least favorite so far. And uh, as I said, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one is uh, the theme isn't as captivating to me, but I can see it's a very good theme and it's well implemented. The look, mainly, I find muted and a, a little boring. It's, it's, it doesn't look exciting. Uh, you know, the, the graphical touches that they, that they put in place here don't, uh, don't excite me. I don't, I don't find myself drawn to this board. It's fiddly, you know. But... Having said all that, and having said that it is my least favorite, and by the way, when I say it's my least favorite, please take that with a grain of salt. I adore this series of games. I'm not saying this is a bad game. I'm saying it's my least favorite out of some of my top 100 games ever. Okay? Um, having said all of that, though, this is the one from the spin-off games that is the most different. This is the most original one. It, it rewrites a lot while still feeling 
like a Pandemic spin-off. A lot of people I know had issues with Pandemic Iberia because they thought, this is a coat of paint on Pandemic. I disagreed with that, and I still do, but uh, a lot of people did feel that way. I don't think anyone's going to be saying that about this game. This is not Pandemic, uh, base Pandemic. This is different. This is very different, I think, in many ways. And so you are, if you are someone who is looking for a Pandemic game that is crunchy, it's interesting, it's tactical and rich, and not just Pandemic again, then this, I think, is, is going to be the one for you. As I said, I, I liked it. I, I've, I've enjoyed my plays of it. I'm going to keep exploring it. I'm going to keep enjoying it. But so far, this is the my, my least uh, you know engrossing of all of the Pandemic games. So... Uh, this one's going to get a seal of approval from me. Um, I recommend you check it out if you fall into the categories I just mentioned, if that's what you're looking for. And that's going to do it. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.